faith, firearms, and freedom. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. This is episode 24, and I am your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran. Here at the Armed Lutheran Radio podcast, we explore the intersection of faith, firearms, and freedom, the Second Amendment, the natural right of self-defense, gun rights, and gun control from a uniquely Christian perspective, particularly a Lutheran perspective. Welcome to the show, and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and for listening We've got a big show for you today. Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense. He usually joins us each week with a great self-defense segment. Well, this week's tip is going to be held over until next week. It fits with the sort of the theme of next week. I'll be traveling. His theme next week is Traveling Light for Safety, so we're going to share that segment with you next week. Aaron does have some classes coming up. In the next few months, he teaches the Defensive Focus Shooting Program, which is uh, the class developed by Rob Pincus. Um, He teaches out at Triple C Tactical in Crescent and in other places. We're putting together a class uh, in October at my home range in White Wright. Um, He's teaching uh, one in July, another in September, which is a combination with Lone Star Medics. Look for links in the show notes for information about those classes. And if you use the promo code Lutheran, you'll get a 20% discount off the regular price of registration. So look for that information, get you some great training, save a little money. In today's show, we're going to look at all of the craziness that happened in the previous week. We're going to be discussing the newest threat to liberty that has the NRA and the ACLU on the same side. It's called No Fly, No Buy, and it's a threat to our due process rights uh, under the Constitution. Sergeant Bill will be uh, bringing us another Ballistic Minute with tips on how to prepare for a major match. We'll be looking at syncretism. There's a word you don't hear every day. And misplaced blame in the wake of the Orlando massacre. And Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, the co-host of Table Talk Radio, will join us once again to talk about the defense of others and how we as armed Christians should be thinking about that subject. All of that is straight ahead right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. Well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. With those words, our founding fathers changed the world. They launched an experiment in freedom, where common lawful citizens are free to speak and gather and worship as they choose. But first among those freedoms is the one freedom that makes the rest possible. For 130 years, we've worked to preserve freedom first. I'm Wayne LaPierre of the National Rifle Association. Hi, this is Reverend Ken Blanchard, also known as the Black Man with a Gun, and you're listening to my friend and brother from another mother, the Armed Lutheran. What a crazy week, right? The Brits vote for independence while our congressmen stage a sit-in in opposition to our constitutional rights. Who would have thought? At the time of this recording, several pieces of gun control legislation were voted on and failed in the U.S. Senate. A compromise bill offered by rhino Republicans like Susan Collins of Maine and supported by turncoat Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire offered a a light version of Dianne Feinstein's No Fly, No Buy bill. Fat cat Democrat congressmen who once marched for civil rights with Martin Luther King Jr. are staging sit-ins to demand that the government encroach on our civil rights. New York liberal Democrat Charles Rangel admitted in an interview that he doesn't think citizens should have guns, but Congress critters like him deserve them. When the NRA and the ACLU are on the same side against the Democrats and the gun banners, you know something bad is going on. 
Democrats shouted down moments of silence in honor of the victims of Orlando. They sang, We shall overcome in response to their failure to pass liberty-killing gun control laws. Overcome what exactly? The Constitution? I can't help but think back to the Democrat convention when the mention of God was met with boos and hisses or the, the Wellstone Memorial when Senator Paul Wellstone, instead of being memorialized, it turned into this ugly, disgusting campaign event. Why don't they just come out and admit it and just replace the jackass on the party logo with the hammer and sickle and be done with it? And I wrote a post after the Umpqua Community College shooting about the unhinged reaction of the left at the time. You know, Seth Rogen and GQ telling Ben Carson to F off. Hillary Clinton suggesting that we should consider the Australian model of gun confiscation and telling debate watchers that she's most proud that she's made the uh, five million men and women who make up the National Rifle Association as her enemies. I called that article The Mask is Off because it's all out there now. We know what they really stand for. We've heard a troy ton of misinformation after Orlando, as we always do. The gun used was not the AR-15, despite the constant drumbeat from the press. It was not an automatic weapon, despite what some despicable trolls like Alan Grayson would tell you. It's not a super powerful killing machine, despite what pansies like Gertz Kuntzman think. It's not the same thing that our military uses, like what some lying congressman from Massachusetts would tell you. It's not easy to purchase. And we already have laws on the books that make straw purchases and purchases across state lines illegal, despite the actions of various reporters and media producers who don't know the law, violate the living hell out of it, and then claim that the law shouldn't apply to them when they get caught. And as Neil Steinberg at the Chicago Sun-Times discovered, men who abuse alcohol and beat their wives can't buy them either. And despite Katie Couric's lies, background checks would not have prevented this or really any of the mass shootings that this country has ever suffered. Despite the lies that we constantly hear from the Brady Bunch or Every Town for Gun Confiscation or Gabby and the Astronaut, we don't have a mass shooting every day in this country. That's another lie. Gun homicide is at a 51-year low, and gun accidents are declining. After the smoke clears, it's easy to say the Orlando shooter should never have gotten a gun. Sure, knowing what we know now, hindsight being 2020, but back then he was a trusted employee of the Department of Homeland Security, or a contractor for the DHS. He had two brushes with the terror watch list back in 2012 and 2014, And in both of those cases, the FBI looked into it and then subsequently took him off the list. The Obama administration has hamstrung the FBI and other federal agencies when it comes to investigating Islamic terrorism. They're more concerned with the Tea Party than they are with ISIS or Al-Qaeda. The gun store where he went to buy body armor and bulk ammunition reported him to the FBI, but they didn't do anything. Disney World was suspicious of him. They reported him. Nothing happened. But the FBI, they took a look at him, probably figured, hey, he's a follower of the religion of peace. He's a a registered Democrat. Got to be some mistake. And off he went. We know the rest. And now we're calling it the worst mass shooting in American history. And we're calling for gun control. It wasn't even the worst mass shooting in American history, by the way. Even that's a lie. See, back in 1890, back in December of 1890, in South Dakota, there was a detachment of the 7th Cavalry that went to a, an Indian camp. I know that's, um, that's not politically correct to say. They went to a, a Native American camp to disarm them. And for those who don't know what that means, the government sent the army to enforce gun control. A misunderstanding led to a gunfight and the government slaughtered somewhere between 150 and 300 Native Americans, including over 60 women and children. The government gave out 20 medals of honor 
to soldiers who participated in that massacre. And now we're debating whether to expand the so-called no-fly list or secret terrorist watch list to be a no-buy list for guns. And I seem to recall that the Huffington and Puffington Post complained it wasn't that long ago about how bad the idea of the secretive government list is. But now, not so much. Back when President Bush was fighting what we used to call the War on Terror, back before President Obama came to office and decided that we, America, was the bad guy, and the JV team just needed some apologizing to and maybe some economic opportunities, and the left was all bent out of shape over the Patriot Act and its potential infringement on people's civil liberties, one of those infringements being due process, how could we detain suspected terrorists at Guantanamo Bay, you know, the ones we actually caught trying to kill people in places like Afghanistan and Iraq? How could we hold them without due process, they claimed? We need to bring them to New York, give them constitutional protections, a government-paid lawyer, and a fair trial. Remember that? Well, we've heard in this latest debate about due process. So what exactly does that mean? Well, given the deplorable state of public education these days, a lot of people probably don't have a clue. Due process is a fundamental constitutional guarantee that all legal proceedings will be fair and that a person will be given notice of the proceedings and an opportunity to be heard before the government acts to take away life, liberty, or property. But being placed on a secretive government watch list and being denied the ability to fly, for example, yeah, that can be annoying, especially if you're on the list simply because you have the same last name as somebody who's a terror suspect. The late Senator Ted Kennedy was on the list, not because he killed Mary Jo Kopechny. I'm not sure why he ended up on the list, but he was. We know that eight-year-olds and six-year-olds have been on the list. But being unable to fly doesn't deprive you of life, liberty, or property. You can still travel. You're not thrown in jail. You're not flown off to Gitmo. You're not executed by firing squad. But being deprived of an enumerated constitutional right is a far different thing. Expanding the no-fly list to make it a no-buy list opens the door to a whole host of abuses by government. It's a bridge too far, and in the wake of a tragic mass shooting in Orlando, we shouldn't rush to build that bridge. I'm not crazy about slippery slope arguments, but this is one of them. Proponents of recent legislation like Susan Collins of Maine, Kelly Ayotte in New Hampshire, they're willing to compromise and to gut due process in order to do something so they can go back to voters with a campaign issue. They say if you're put on the list, you can appeal, and the government will pay your legal fees if you win that appeal. That's really big of them. But since you don't know how you got on the list, you don't even know that you're on the list until you're denied that enumerated right, and the seller won't tell you why you're denied, how exactly are you supposed to appeal? Who do you appeal to? Why is it the burden of proof shifted to you to prove your innocence? You become guilty of what you don't know because the government won't tell you. And until you can prove that you're innocent, your rights are gone. But if you don't know what you're accused of or how you got on the list in the first place, how do you do that? Gun Owners of America calls this the Compromise Republican Alternative Plan, or CRAP for short. This turns American jurisprudence on its head. Your Second, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment rights are upended. You're accused of no crime, yet you're denied a fundamental right. You're not allowed to know what you've been accused of or to see the evidence against you. You're compensated for your efforts to clear your name, but only if you succeed in doing it. How does any of that square with the Constitution? When the ACLU agrees with the NRA on this, 
you know the idea isn't a good one. Why is it that the Second Amendment is worth infringing upon? Why is it the one enumerated right that people in Washington seem to think is okay to infringe upon? Why not the first? If you're on a terrorist watch list, why are you allowed to exercise your First Amendment rights and to spread your propaganda and to recruit more followers or communicate with those for whom you work? Shouldn't the no-fly, no-buy list include the purchase of cell phones, for example? We should have a background check for cell phones, particularly those temporary no-plan burner phones that terrorists like. If you sign up for a Google account or AOL, do they still have that? or Hotmail, or Yahoo accounts, any of those free email services, shouldn't you have a background check and be denied if you're on a watch list? If you sign up for Facebook, or Twitter, or YouTube, I think those companies should have to verify your identity. No more anonymous accounts. And check the watch list before giving you an account so that suspected terrorists can't use those accounts to spread their propaganda. If a person is so dangerous that we can't risk letting them on a plane or letting them buy a gun, why do we allow them to assemble or to go to mosques or churches or rallies? Shouldn't they just be arrested on site when we find them in one of these venues? After all, the First Amendment can turn a lone wolf into a pack. If you love the First Amendment, if you love the Bill of Rights, If you love the Constitution, you can't support this. If you oppose the Patriot Act when President Bush was in office, but you support this, you're a hypocrite. There can't be a compromise when it comes to liberty. Remember, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither. If you try to purchase a gun for someone who can't, you can buy yourself 10 years in jail. If a friend or relative asks you to lie to a federally licensed firearms retailer so you can buy a gun for him, don't do it. It's not worth 10 years in jail. Whatever you do, don't lie for the other guy. This message is brought to you as a public service by the NSSF, the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Pistols, prayer, and potluck. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. This is your Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill. Today's topic is preparing for a major match. Now, I like to prepare for any major match, whether it's a state match or a regional or a nationals or a world's match, whatever it may be, I like to prepare for it the exact same way that I prepare for any other match, even your local club match. If you're a competitive shooter, if you're a competitive-minded person, you should have the same amount of stress on yourself, the same amount of focus, all those things at even a club-level match as you would at any other higher-level match. Now, I'll be the first one to say when it comes to a club-level match, I have been known to try different things, different, you know, pushing the boundaries of a technique or trying to do different things that I might not do, uh, you know, basically shooting a little bit more aggressive, maybe not as uh, as conservative as, as I might in a uh, sanctioned match or anything else, whether it be IDPA or USPSA. I don't actually shoot USPSA yet. But I still believe the preparation for that match should be the same for any other match. You want to make sure you have all your gear, make sure you have all the stuff that you need, um, get plenty of rest and hydrated, and you should be ready to go. Now, there are some things at a major match that you might expect and see more than you would at, say, a club-level match. 
like more props. They may have more windows or phone booths or a little bridge you got to walk across. I've even sat on a little mini roller coaster. You might not have those at uh, club matches or, you know, even sitting in a car or something like that or under a car. So there's more props, but it's still your basic thing. You're still shooting. You're still your fundamentals. There will be probably more partial targets, whether they're hardcover or targets hidden behind a barrel or a barricade, or they just have non-threats in front of them. And that's another thing you'll have more of, non-threat targets. They tend to kind of amp up the difficulty, more so that you just have to take a little bit more time in getting an accurate shot. You'll see a lot of what I call gimmicks, um, like your load and stow, or one of my favorites. You're cleaning your gun when, and you have to pick your gun up off a table and load it, or pull it out of a case and load it and shoot, or something like that. Pull it out from under a cash register. IDPA likes to use a lot of these little real-life scenario gimmicks. And you know what? That's kind of what makes IDPA so fun. You're definitely going to see more stages, so bring more snacks and drinks and stuff to keep you hydrated, keep you focused, and to keep you going. Um, and it's also going to take longer. Each stage is going to take longer because everybody's going to want to, you know, go over their stage. They're going to score them a little bit more meticulously. And along with that, it's going to be a longer day. Now, my local club, we shoot anywhere from seven to nine stages on a Saturday morning match. And, yeah, we're usually shooting till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but if you go to a sanctioned match, you may shoot 10 stages or more, and you might be there shooting until 5 o'clock. They even break for lunch, so understand that. Understand that it's going to be a little slower and sometimes a little boring and tedious, but if you're expecting it, you're prepared for it, shouldn't be any problem. Bring a chair. This has been your Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill. Go get prepared for your next local and or major match. Help support Armed Lutheran Radio. Visit www.patreon.com slash armed lutheran and become a sponsor today. This next story comes from the local newspaper where I used to live back in North Carolina. It's the Hickory Daily Record. And the headline reads, Lenore Rhine University honors memory of shooting victims in Orlando. Now, for those of you who don't know, Lenore Rhine was founded as a Lutheran university, a Lutheran college, really. It's part of the ELCA, which some would say stands for Every Liberal Cause in America. It's actually the Evangelical Lutheran Churches in America. From the story, we read, A cultural cross-section of the local community came out Wednesday night to share their grief over the June 12th shooting at Pulse Nightclub in Orlando, Florida, during a memorial service held in Grace Chapel at Lenore Rhine University. Along with honoring the 49 who died in Orlando, the service also remembered the nine who lost their lives last year on June 17th in the shooting at Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Quote, We're thinking about a massacre in a church and a massacre in a nightclub. The bottom line is that we're all God's children and we have to understand this as one community. Pastor Kim Moss of Mount Pisgah AME Church in Hickory said, So we're coming together as an ecumenical community in prayer in recognition of both. Although the devil meant for evil, God meant for good, and we have been able to join a wonderful partnership in moving forward with both of our communities. How will this partnership manifest itself? Will the participating churches show love and compassion to the, to the homosexual community while encouraging them to repent and be saved? Based on the rest of this article, I'm guessing not. A group of religious leaders, Jewish, Catholic, Presbyterian, Baptist, AME Church, Lutheran, and by Lutheran they don't mean conservative, 
They don't mean LCMS or Wells. You see, this is syncretism. Webster's Dictionary defines syncretism as the combination of different forms of belief or practice. And the LCMS renounces syncretism in Article 6.2 of the LCMS Constitution. Article 6.2 condemns the taking part in services and sacramental rites of heterodox congregations or of congregations of mixed confession. Why? Aren't we all Christians? Shouldn't we come together in prayer in times of trouble? What's wrong with that? Well, we should come together as Americans in times of trouble. We, after 9-11, for example, there was a brief period of national unity, um, a unity of grief and purpose and righteous anger uh, about what had been done to us. But we're not called to jettison our beliefs and to take part in services with those whose confessions are not our own. Now, that doesn't mean that lay people can't attend a non-Lutheran service. My entire family is not Lutheran, with the exception of my immediate family, for example. So, uh, not uncommon to see me when I go back to North Carolina to visit the the church that I grew up in. Um, It's not a Lutheran church. But you won't see me take part in things like communion. What we're talking about here and what what Article 6.2 is talking about is Lutheran churches cannot and should not host interfaith services, and Lutheran pastors should not participate in those services like the one at Lenore Rhine. So what was the purpose of this shindig? Clergy and laity and community leaders coming together for what? If the purpose was to express sympathy and to discuss ways to reduce violence and discrimination, great, that'd be one thing. But that's not what they did. This was a prayer service held in the chapel at Lenore Rhine. Anita Sherrill offered the prayer for the LGBT community and shared some of her story. Quote, I'm 52 years old. I grew up in the South being gay, she said. I never imagined, never dreamed that I would stand in a church confessing and accepting the fact of who I am. End quote. And there's the problem. This was an interfaith service where people living lives of unrepentant sin were accepted. Remember our conversation with Pastor Bennett in last week's show. Loving our neighbors in the LGBT community is what we're called to do. Love our neighbors. But it's not the same as acceptance. We can love a person without accepting what they do or how they live. We can help and provide for their bodily needs. We can donate blood. We can call for an end to discrimination. We can render assistance in an emergency. But also remember what Pastor Wolfmuller talked about a few weeks back. Rendering bodily temporal aid gives us an opportunity to talk about the redeeming work of Christ. It's an opportunity to provide spiritual support, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with an unbeliever and with the sinful world. Not to excuse or accept their sins. That's why conservative Lutherans would have nothing to do with this service. Cheryl credited the support from her family for helping her through the process of acceptance. She admits there are still many who don't. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Quote, Some may never understand our lifestyle. Many will never even accept it. But if I could speak some words that Dr. Martin Luther King said... Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I think we understand the lifestyle pretty well. And so does God, by the way. The Bible's fairly clear about this, as we talked about last week with Pastor Bennett. And no, we'll never accept or condone it. Some liberal Christians apparently will. But recognizing your lifestyle as a sin is not the same as rejecting you for your skin color. So let's not confuse the two. It's a little bit different. And recognizing that you are a sinner, as we are all sinners, does not mean that we cannot or should not love you as we love ourselves, as Christ calls us to do. Back to um, Miss Cheryl. Quote, Someone has to speak out on behalf of the LGBT community. You don't have to accept us. But you don't have to kill us either, she said. If there's one thing I could ask of you before you condemn us, 
study the scripture. That little piece of self-righteousness really stuck in my craw. First off, notice who was absent from this Star Wars bar scene of pap liberal diversity. Muslims. The ones who actually want to kill people like Miss Cheryl. They weren't there. They didn't speak. Just a bunch of liberal Christians. And who is Miss Cheryl pointing the bony finger of indignation at? Christians. The ones who got together to pray for her and others like her and the victims of this terrible tragedy. Not the ones who actually want to kill her. No, no. Not the ones who declare that the punishment for her lifestyle is not a lack of acceptance, but an end to her life. The ones she's talking about and talking down to are the guilt-ridden liberal Christians who prefer to avoid hurting people's feelings rather than proclaiming God's word. The ones who are rewriting God's word in the name of diversity and are opening their arms to her and accepting her in her unrepentant sin. Those are the ones she's telling Don't kill us. Rabbi Dennis Jones of Temple Beth Shalom added to the service by sounding the ancient Jewish musical horn called the shofar. His hope was that the sound of the shofar would inspire everyone who heard it to root out prejudice, bigotry, and hatred and replace it with acceptance and love. Acceptance and love. There are those two words again. You can love somebody without accepting their sinful behavior. Back to the article. For Reverend C. William Schreiber of St. Aloysius Roman Catholic Church, Wednesday's service was a chance to reinforce a sense of hope. Quote, In this tragic act, although it's very serious, it also provides us with an opportunity to look for the good things in humanity, Schreiber said. For we're not Greeks, we're not Romans, we're not Catholic, Muslim, Jews, or Protestants, In God's eyes, we are humans. We are members of one race, the human race. I'd just like to point out that it wasn't Greeks or Romans or Catholics or Jews or Protestants who pulled the trigger at the Pulse nightclub. None of those groups are throwing gays off of buildings or hanging them from cranes in the public square in Iran or calling for their execution. There is, however, one religion that is. Did the rabbi or the priest or the right reverends of the various denominations denounce Islam and its hateful ideology? The ideology that encourages the murder of gays? Like Miss Cheryl? Or were they too busy celebrating sin in the name of diversity and unity? Politically correct, squishy Christians have got to stop blaming themselves for intolerance and must boldly proclaim that sin is sin, no matter how uncomfortable it is to point out, no matter whose feelings might be hurt, we must never shy away from doing that. We must love the sinner and hate the sin and recognize who the real enemy is here. It's not the baker who refuses to bake a cake. It's not the pizza parlor in Indiana that refused to cater a gay wedding. It's not the photographer who refused to to photograph a gay wedding. It's not the millions of Americans who recognize that allowing grown men into women's bathrooms is a bad idea. The problem is Islam. And until we come to grips with that, no amount of unity or acceptance is going to make a difference. If you carry a gun for personal protection, it's imperative that you get a good holster. When I started out, I had no idea what that meant, and I went through a bunch of really bad holsters. Then I found Cook's Holsters at CooksHolsters.com. Cook's Holsters are custom made to fit your specific firearm. Available in lots of colors, including custom printed Kydex, Cook's Holsters are made in the USA and the great state of Georgia, and come with a lifetime warranty against defects and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Visit www.cooksholsters.com and use the promo code ARMEDPODCAST and get a 15% discount off everything in the store. You put a lot of time and money into the firearm you choose to carry for personal protection. Carry it in the best holster. Cooksholsters.com Welcome. 
Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. There have been numerous examples of concealed carry permit holders intervening to stop crimes. In some cases, however, they tragically result in their deaths. Joseph Wilcox is the best or maybe the worst example in 2014. He confronted one of the two cop killers in uh, Las Vegas Walmart, but was tragically killed by the second gunman. Most recently, we have this shooting in Arlington, Texas, where a good Samaritan intervened in what turned out to be a domestic dispute and was tragically killed. Many training manuals and videos uh, talk about the defense of others from a legal perspective. When is it legal to use force to defend others? I've heard and read from those who suggest that they would never get involved because no stranger is worth risking their own lives to save. There are some who suggest, uh, even among instructors and pro-gun media, that um, you only get involved directly if you are or your family members are personally threatened. But how should we think about this subject as armed Christians? Pastor Brian Wolfmuller of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and the co-host of Table Talk Radio joins us again to discuss this subject. Welcome back, Pastor. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me back. It's great. Um, You mentioned the parable of the Good Samaritan in our previous discussion of the three estates, and this is what made me think to to get back in touch with you and and wanted to get your um, thoughts here. Um, You suggested that, you know, the Samaritan wouldn't have just stood by and done nothing if he had arrived on the scene 30 minutes earlier and found the robbers in the process of beating the man, that he would have found a rock or some other weapon to try to defend him. In our vocation as father, as parent, we're responsible for protecting our families, but God calls on us to love our neighbors as ourselves. But unless we have that vocation of police, should we intervene in the defense of others? Well, this is a very, I mean, this is a very difficult question. And, and, I think it's it's not. I mean, we can press around some of the contours of these things, how how we think about these things rightly, uh, how we order our lives rightly, how we act rightly in various different situations. Mm-hmm. But it's um, it's going to be very difficult to have a set of rules and say here here is where we do intervene, here is where we don't, um, be, because. You know, the, there's a phrase in our uh, Lutheran confessions. It's really quite wonderful. Um, Luther calls the devil the master of a thousand arts. <laughs> now he he goes on to say that the scriptures are the masters of ten thousand arts. Uh, so it always are overcoming the devil. Right. But but the idea is that the devil's the, the devil has a lot of tricks that he can play, and so what that means is that sin will manifest itself in a number of different ways. Uh, in a number of different places, to a number of different degrees and various different uh, um, dangers, and that uh, our our reaction should be you know proportional to that. So um, so 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 maybe that's the place to start is to that we realize that the existence, for example, of of guns or and to abstract perhaps a little bit of guns, the the existence, of uh, of weapons that can exercise violent authority or violent force on, upon someone mm-hmm. uh, is a result of the fall into sin. Right. Uh, the, the, this is because uh, Adam and Eve have have sinned, and and even uh, the wielding of the sword, uh, or a wielding of a gun, or a wielding of violent authority, is already an acknowledgement that we have fallen into sin, that right. we. Uh, that the thing that things are not as they should be in the world, uh, that that um, that we need force to protect, for example, our homes and our families and our property, is an acknowledgement that there are people who would come and take the things that don't belong to them. Either they would take property, or they would take uh, chastity uh, mm-hmm. from our wives and daughters, or they would take uh, our lives from uh, from our family. Right. So so we realize that when we're when we're dealing, when we're reacting to sin, and this is maybe the, the first point, when we're reacting to sin by trying to minimize it, by exercising or not exercising force or authority or whatever, we realize that we ourselves are stepping into this, uh, into, the, into the realm of sin, and that oftentimes things are going to go very, very poorly. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes when someone, um, if, if someone, you know, for example, breaks into your house uh, to steal your TV, Right. Uh, or or whatever, then it's going to be an ugly situation no matter what you do. Right. No, right. Uh, so so um, 
so that it, so so maybe that's just again to to set the stage and say because we're living in this fallen world and when someone is coming to break one of the commandments against us or our family or against the strangers we're walking down the street uh we it, it, there's often not going to be pretty answers or mm-hmm. simple simple solutions right right and, and not to, obviously not to suggest that we should recklessly you know throw ourselves into any altercation that we come across i mean there have been numerous examples like the one in in arlington uh of you know thinking that you're doing the right thing jumping in and and paying a a, a pretty nasty price for it um i wrote about sometime last year i wrote an article about uh uh, this guy in in Maryland who tried to break up a fight between two teenage girls. He just thought he was doing the right thing. Next thing he knows, he's set upon by fifty teenagers who beat him almost to death. So, mm-hmm. so a measure of judgment obviously um, should be exercised before we we make those decisions. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And and so then we we want to be able to think perhaps proportionally about these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So we, we want to always, and, and I imagine, you know, I haven't been to the, um, uh, to the training that you have and, and I haven't been uh, paying as close attention to these things, uh, as you have, which I, I think is really quite great as when I, when I, uh, read folks that are particularly interested in guns and self-defense, it's really quite wonderful to see the very reflective and thoughtful approach that they're taking to this, to the fact that I I possess armed I, I, I possess a violent force and and so I that that is that demands a a responsibility of mm-hmm. me a thoughtfulness uh, a, a way of living my life that is particularly ordered um, and I, and I think that's right uh, so I would imagine that one of the things that they would talk about in training uh, would be that you want to apply uh, the least the least amount of force that's necessary. Right. Uh, so that always, if, for example, if it's possible to have the police or the other the authorities to intervene in a sort of situation, then that is always the first choice. Exactly. If, if we have to intervene in a sort of situation to protect someone's life or property or body or chastity or whatever, that we would intervene with a proportional force. So I, I would think that, you know, you... Um, you you don't bring a bazooka to a knife fight is that a, <laughs> a saying? That's that's exactly right. That's uh, we one of the things that is always taught is that the the amount or the level of force that you apply can only be proportional to the to the force the the deadly threat that you're facing. So if someone right. is coming at you with with hands and feet, that's a deadly threat um, that can can kill you. But if you have the means to escape it. Or if, let's say they're across the street from you and they're just yelling, "Hey, I'm going to kill you!" You can't just pull out a gun and shoot them because they threatened you. Right. It has That's to right. be proportional. And that idea of proportionality comes from uh, the just war theory, which developed in the church mm-hmm. as as uh, as as nations were embracing the gospel and so kings uh, were uh, understanding the scripture and the Christian worldview, they were asking, well, how can we wield the sword and go to war and be Christian? And so they, uh, the Christians would talk about uh, just war theory, uh, which had r- certain rules or, or things to think about both before going into war and how you engage in war. And I suppose in some ways that um, it, it's helpful to reflect on that when when we have these little individual wars come to us, right, <laughs> and, right. you know, uh, and one of the marks of the just war is that it's defensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're defending yourself or you're defending uh, your innocent neighbor. Um, you're not, you're never offensive. You're never bringing the war to somebody else. Right. Uh, and, and so we're always thinking about not only self-defense, but family defense, property defense, chastity defense, and, and neighbor defense uh, as well. Right. Well, that's uh, and that brings me to something I was thinking about earlier as well. Um, in preparing for next week's segment with Pastor Bennett, I've, we were looking at an article where the guy writes it from this Christian perspective, totally pacifist, totally opposed to gun ownership unless it's a hunting rifle. And so, you know, the idea that you might, as a Christian, intervene with deadly force to save someone else was completely out of the question. They even suggested that. If you came on came upon somebody, a, a woman, for example, being viciously attacked, 
um, that it would be okay to call the police, but if the police came and shot and killed the attacker and saved the woman, that would still be bad because killing in any circumstances is sin for Christians. Yeah, um, I, I, that, this, is abs- this is an absurd sort of argument. I, I might concede um, that killing in any circumstances is a sin for a Christian. I, I might concede that if you are able to say that, look, a, the, the, soldier, the, the, the policeman is not killing because he's a Christian, or he's not killing as a Christian, right. he's killing as a policeman. <laughs> or, right. or you, as a Christian, are, uh, find someone being attacked like that. Uh, you're not called in that way to be a Christian, I suppose. You're called to be a neighbor, which right. means you're called to defend that person. And and being a Christian does not remove us from from all of these other vocations that we have of of child, of father, of mother, of of uh, of um, citizen, of neighbor, of property owner. Uh, th- this is a it's th- th- that's a uh, an idea that. That kind of asceticism uh, was the mark of monasticism in the Middle Ages. When you went to right. become a monk, you would uh, for, you would take a vow of poverty and chastity and obedience. So you would leave you would leave the realm of family. You've, you'd leave the realm of economics and of politics, and um, and that's wrong. It's a it's a false sort of love for the neighbor. It's an invented love that is trying to go above the Ten Commandments. Uh, but it's impossible. And that kind of monasticism is working its way back into a lot of Christian thinking today. And I would suspect that whenever you find a pacifist, mm-hmm. um, a pacifist Christian, that that's the, that's the spirit of monasticism that you're dealing with there. Uh, that somehow being a Christian means that now you're no longer a father. Uh, now you're no longer a neighbor. Now you're no longer a citizen. I was... Meditating a little bit on the on the Ten Commandments this past week, just looking at and and was looking at the large catechism. I thought Luther's words on on the fifth commandment were instructive here. And I thought this was this was a beautiful example where he says it's as if I just as if I saw someone navigating and laboring in deep water or fallen into fire and could extend my hand to help to pull him out and save him and yet refuse to do it. So if it, basically his suggestion is that if you have the opportunity to to help a neighbor in need, in bodily need or in in in, in distress, um, and have an opportunity to save them, and you don't do it, it's just as if you murdered them yourself. Right. No, that's exactly right. So that the the fifth commandment is not only a, a passive and negative thing, but it it demands our uh, activity as well. And we can, which means we can break this in command. We can break the fifth commandment uh, by not acting, uh, by seeing someone in distress, and by leaving them in distress. Now, this again does not mean that there's a there's a simple rule for what our help should be. You know what right. I mean? If, for example, we see someone drowning, and um, and and we jump in the lake, but but oh yeah, I don't know how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> the, then that's not only it's not keeping the fifth commandment at all it's it's just being stupid um you know uh if um you know if so, so that so that my my help um in these sorts of things is going to should be an act of wisdom you know mm-hmm. and oh, this is tough because these things just happen all of a sudden you know you're you're driving along and Blam! You're at the scene of a car accident, right. and you and you want to do everything you can, but you know, so your you, your ability, um, your love is going to be limited in those cases by your ability. Mm-hmm. And and in these sort of situations, and and I think this is something helpful for for Christians to think about uh, what what life is like in this fallen world, is that there are there are going to be times in our lives where the whole situation is just is just bad. Mm-hmm. So this guy who tried to, you were reading the story about, and I can't remember what the situation was, but he intervened to, to stop a, a theft or uh, a, like the, a... The one in Texas? Yeah, yeah, that one. Um, what happened was he saw uh, what he didn't realize was a d- domestic dispute, and the, the man uh, in the dispute actually pulled out a, a gun and sh- shot his, well, I think it was his wife in the leg and jumped in the car and tried to drive away. 
at that point, the Samaritan wasn't really trying to defend this woman any longer because she was already shot. The, the assailant was already trying to escape, so she was no longer in any danger. The, the guy went to his car, retrieved his own firearm, and tried to stop the man from getting away. And what happened was the guy stopped, he got out of the car, pulled his gun out, and shot the Good Samaritan in the forehead. So, oh, so Aaron Israel, who does our, our weekly self-defense tips, his suggestion or his, you know, the lesson that he came away with from this was the smart thing to do in that case is call the police and be a good citizen, be a good witness, tell them what you saw so that, because in the end, nothing really changed. The woman was still shot. The man still was arrested. But the only difference was that the good Samaritan in this case was dead. Right. Yeah. That's a, I mean, it's just absolutely tragic. And you realize that if you're, I mean, if you're in the realm of that kind of stupid violence, mm -hmm. then, I mean, nothing's going to go right. I mean, even, mm -mm. you know, e even, even if the guy doesn't get the gun, even if he doesn't try to stop, I mean, kind of looking back, it's always, hindsight's always, you know, 2020. Right. And, and it's easy to kind of armchair the thing. And you, but you got to, uh, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for the guy, but he, here he is minding his own business. It's not like he was going around looking for no. uh, like some sort of vigilante or anything. And like apparently this. he didn't even have the gun on him. He It was in his car. He yeah, was coming out of the store when he witnessed this. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, uh, I mean, I think that to the, I, the thing that we articulated at the beginning, the idea that you want to have a proportionality, that when the guy with the gun is leaving, then you say, uh, thank the Lord <laughs> that he's leaving. <laughs> right. You know? I don't want to keep you around. Right. Uh, of course, you're worried about where he's going, you know, and who else he intends to harm. And you're right. trying to think about all those things. But but this is the point. If you're in the I mean, uh, there could have been someone standing by who didn't even try to intervene, who gets gets hit with a, a bullet, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a stray bullet and 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 dies as well. I mean, you just can't. Um, you, you, you when you're when you're in the vicinity of that kind of uh, violent sinfulness, then things are going to go wrong. And mm -hmm. there's a way that I think we, we we acknowledge that when we pray the Lord's prayer and say, "Deliver us from evil," and we ask the Lord to protect and keep us. What we're praying for in the end is that He would take us from this veil of tears to be with Himself in heaven, because mm -hmm. as long as we're in this world and in our flesh, in our sinful flesh. We are in the presence of evil, and, and these sorts of disastrous sort of things are going to happen. And, and they cannot be prevented. I mean, we can do what we, what we can to try to limit violence. I mean, and mostly the way that we can try to limit violence is first by prayer, and then second by making, making sure that all the kids have a father. <laughs> I mean, that's, right. that's going to be our number one thing. But we can... We can we can arm ourselves, we can protect ourselves, we can plan ahead, but in the end, there is no, there is no complete insulation from, this, from the fall until we reach the resurrection. Well, thank you for um, joining us and giving us some insights into this uh, very complicated subject. I appreciate you taking the time to come back on the show with us. Yeah, oh, I'm ha great and happy to be here, and, um, and I'm really... Uh, I'm really thankful uh, that you are reflecting on these things and meditating on these things as well. I think the, the more we think of these things and meditate on this world and our place in it, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the better off it will be for all of us. Amen. And that's going to wrap it up for today's show. Thanks to Sergeant Bill and to our special guest, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, for joining me today. I'll be on vacation next week, so I'm putting together next week's episode now, and we'll have some travel tips from Aaron Israel, another Ballistic Minute tip from Sergeant Bill, and Pastor John Bennett will join me to take a look at a particularly loony gun control article from Sojourners. So uh, look forward to that next week. Thank you all for listening, downloading, and subscribing. Remember, keep praying, keep shooting. We'll talk to you next week.
show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Armed Lutheran and like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash The Armed Lutheran. You can contact us by email at armedlutheranradio at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 855-54-ARMED. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio.